Hello, I'm Cheryl McCarthy of the City University of New York. Welcome to One to One. We've elected a new president. What does Barack Obama's election say about our priorities? When did the war on terror become an asterisk? Maybe it was when our house of cards, or should we say our house of condos and co-ops, came tumbling down, and our economic meltdown affected not just the rarefied few, but all of us. Joining us to help us sort out the mess and explain where and how we went wrong is a longtime expert in the field of mortgage and asset-backed securities, Dr. Ann Zisu, the new chairperson of the Department of Business at the City University's New York City College of Technology. Welcome. Thank you. Obviously, the economy has taken center stage of the uh, election and everything else in the country right now. When were the signs of a meltdown apparent to you? Well, I think when we all became aware of it was in the summer of 07. Uh, but clearly, we should have realized that this was going to happen. Um, I, was, I had not realized with mortgages, but I was aware with credit cards. And it was always a subject that I would use in class. Um, I always ask my students, how many of you have credit card? And everybody raised their hands. The first day of college, they obtain a credit card when they don't have a job. And it turns out that the model of credit cards was applied to mortgages. People that did not qualify for mortgages uh, obtained loans for the purchase of houses and uh, under terms actually that they did not understand. Um, variable rate mortgages are not new. They have existed for many years. But clearly, um, in uh, between 2002 and, or 2001 and 2003, four rates were extremely low. So you could make loans to people at low rates. But these were actually variable rate loans, not fixed rate loans. and. Uh, they, ha they had exactly the format of a credit card. You would only pay interest um, for two or three years. There was no amortization in those loans. And then there would be a reset um, where the interest rate would go to, for example, a LIBOR plus five, 600 basis points. Obviously, the mortgagors signing this contract did not understand, they did not understand the term of these loans. They would look simply at what is my monthly mortgage now and uh, two years later, three years later, they were hit with the reset payments. And of course, they could not afford them. Now, it's interesting that, that, that you recognize what was, you know, how this was building in the whole credit card area. Because I guess the, 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 credit, car, the credit card business has not really hit yet. But everybody is saying that's the next, econ so that's where we're going to see the, the next part of the economic crisis. Yes, I'm surprised that it hasn't yet. And I'm surprised that not much is being done about it given that we're experiencing already the uh, mortgage crisis. Um, so we need, obviously, regulators to get involved. But right now, we have to take care of other things. Right. Um, and the, the main thing is actually how we can avoid more foreclosure. Um, and it would benefit the mortgagors on one hand, but also the investors, because all these mortgages have been pulled together and securitized. Um, and uh, you have uh, investors all over the world in these mortgage-backed back securities. And the way these uh, securitizations are put together, you have some form of credit enhancement, which is usually determined, the level of which is determined by rating agencies. So if you want to issue AAA mortgage-backed securities, you're going to follow a model that is imposed by rating agencies, and they will tell the structure um, for AAA, you need, let's say, 10% credit enhancement. But the rating agency did not uh, adapt their model to these subprime mortgages. Uh, maybe they increased the credit enhancement required to obtain a AAA, but not enough. When you say credit enhancement, what do you mean? So you have actually the mainly two ways of providing credit. Credit enhancement means protecting investors in mortgage-backed secu securities from default. Mm -hmm. um, it doesn't protect them from prepayment risk, from interest rate risk, which are big risk in mortgages. But it will protect at least a portion of the investors 
from default. Um, but what happened is that... So are we talking about things like down payment or credit rating or are we talking about something else? No, it's simply let's say you have a pool of mortgages, uh, so you have thousands of mortgages in that pool, um, of mortgages actually in that pool. And uh, uh, obviously every month there are some that default. So you're going to foreclose a property and then whatever you can recuperate you'll pay the investors, but there may be actually, especially now, you, you don't recuperate the full amount of the outstanding loan because we know that properties have been going down. Right. Um, so you, the way you structure it, you may have a senior note and a subordinated note. So for example, subordinated note is 10%. The senior note are protected by the subordinated note. So you have investors in the subordinated note and they're going to get a higher yield because they're taking the risk the credit risk. And the senior note will have a smaller spread above Treasury because they're protected by this subordinated note. But what happens when you have uh, well, this tremendous wave of default, which is going to eat this cushion? So the B note, we, we call it B note, the subordinated note, is eventually wiped out. Mm -hmm. And now you start to eat into the senior note. Um, so now uh, what is being done is actually uh, there are uh, different approaches in it, it, it's not to it's not to um, protect investors really to protect mortgagors and people living in their home uh, try to avoid eviction and uh, so there, are, there have been different plans one is actually the, f the hope for homeowners which is to help these people um, stay in the property and uh, help them refinance their current mortgage with a mortgage the amount of which is now actually 90 percent of the current value of the property. So for these people it's exchanging the current mortgage which they cannot actually uh, they, they, they cannot make the monthly payments. The, the outstanding the new mortgage would be reduced in value and uh, this is the program actually with FHA. Um, but there are other programs that are being developed and uh, actually JP Morgan followed one by the American Securitization Forum where they suggest to, instead of replace mortgages, so that means refinancing the mortgages, they uh, suggest that another way would be to renegotiate the outstanding mortgages. The, the characteristics of these mortgages. Mm -hmm. And uh, clearly, even though these mortgages actually are not on the balance sheet of, of banks, they are with investors because they've been securitized. Right. Uh, but investors are going to benefit from that because if you don't do anything, these, mo these people are going to default on right. their own. Right. They're going to default, um, so that means that investor will lose. Uh, property value will go down even further, uh, and it's a snowball effect. You know, it, there are all kinds of people, a number of different actors who contributed to this subprime mortgage crisis. I mean, there are the, the, uh, the people who bought houses they couldn't afford, it, obviously. Uh, there are the banks who sold, who gave these mortgages to people who couldn't afford them. There are the financial types who bundled them up, securitized them, and sold them as these exotic forms of securities that a lot of people don't understand, certainly I mm -hmm. don't. Uh, the government for deregulating, you know, the financial sphere. Is there one culprit that you think a bigger culprit than another who's primarily responsible for this or more responsible for what happened than anybody else, or is it just a number of different people. I, I, I think the banks. Are really? The one, yes. They, the way they design these mortgages, uh, tricking people in, in obtaining those loans. Uh, also, the, the, uh, the you, you didn't even have to meet a mortgage broker. You would go online and they, have this, they had this program, actually, uh, uh, one called Fast Qual. Uh, fast for qualification and you would just spend a few minutes and that's it you will prove for a mortgage and this has been actually I think uh, so you didn't even have to pay commission to the mortgage brokers 
Um, and uh, so there was this wave of people applying for mortgages and obtaining them, not understanding the structure of it, not qualifying for them. Um, but banks were making the fees in originating those mortgages, mm -hmm. and then they would sell them. So actually, they, they would, and then they would be securitized. Uh, I mean, obviously, it's not just the banks. I think the rating agencies are at fault um, for assigning very high ratings on these loans, for not monitoring them properly. Um, um, you know, it's very interesting to me because, you know, um, years ago as a reporter, I mean, we were writing about the, the redlining of, you know, minority communities. You know, if you're black and uh, Latino and poor, you you couldn't get, uh, you couldn't buy a house because you could in your neighborhood because, you, you know, no banks would, would lend you the money. Uh, and, you know, we talked about as that as discriminatory. And then all of a sudden, banks decided, well, we, you know, it's going to lend money to this, this same group of people, you know, but it's under this new system where we'll lend you the money, but then we absolve ourselves fr from any risk mm -hmm. by selling these off, and you can have the money, but as long as we don't have any, uh, any risk for it. Sure, and actually the government supported that. Uh, clearly it was a way of uh, having everybody accessing property. To, to, uh, a property. Um, and, and, but these banks were, so, except besides generating fees at origination for themselves, but then don't forget that they service these mortgages. So even though they sell the mortgages to either Fannie Mae, Freddie Mac, or some investment banks that then pull them together and securitize them, the banks still service the loan. Now, servicing means they're going to monitor, they will collect the monthly payments, transfer them to um, a special purpose vehicle, and eventually they will pass them to investors, um, making sure that the payments are made on time, and uh, if they're not made on time, they're the ones that have to uh, either, well, inform the mortgage or first, and then eventually foreclose the property. So that's part of the servicing. Um, and they are paid, uh, they receive between 25 and 50 basis points of the outstanding mortgage per year. So that's, an, that's the motivation also for these banks, mm -hmm. uh, which is a tremendous income to banks. Wow, it seems so cynical and very exploitative. Yes. What the banks were doing. Yes. We have to take a short break. I'll be back with Dr. Anne Sisu, chairperson of the Department of Business at CUNY's New York City College of Technology. Every year, one million families face losing their homes to foreclosure. If you're ignoring your mortgage issues, things will only get worse. Call 1-888-995-HOPE, because nothing is worse than doing nothing. Welcome back to One to One. I'm Cheryl McCarthy, talking with Dr. Anne Sisu, chairperson of the Department of Business at the City University's New York City College of Technology. So, we have this government bailout or buyout, whichever you you, you want to call it, um, which I think a lot of people don't really quite understand. Could you? sort of summarize what that's supposed to do? I'm not sure I understand it myself. <laughs> <laughs> well, there are, there are different components, clearly, and uh, obviously there is the auto industry, there is a financial uh, industry, and uh, who knows, probably healthcare is going to come up. I mean, every day you, get up, you wake up and another company is in trouble. Just looking for the, a buyout. But if you look at, if you look at the, the, the banks and, you know, the... the the bailout in response to the mortgage crisis. Who is, who is this money going to and what's it going to do? Well, you're trying to, they're trying to buy troubled assets, which of course are mortgages. Uh, the hedge funds have been obviously part of this problem and they have invested in, in, in these subprime mortgages. Um, So my sense is that they're partly buying, part of it is to buy some stock in some of these banks, 
and part of it is to buy up some of the loans themselves. Is that accurate? Yes, uh, but I don't know the details. Mm -hmm. I don't know the details, and mm -hmm. I'm still trying to actually figure it out, okay. even that every day there is a, another component to it. I mean, now, uh, today it was AIG. They're going to increase now to, uh, they're talking $150 billion. Uh, we're debating the auto loan. So it's not yet a clear plan. Okay, um, okay. And why, why AIG, which, was an which is a, a large insurance company? Why AIG? AIG has over 100,000 em em people working for them all over the world. Um, well, AIG has a lot of outstanding contracts, and that is the same has been the same with investment banks. So uh, if those outstanding contracts fails, it, it will have other consequences. Many many companies will be affected. So it's a way of stopping the bleeding. Mm -hmm. um, and. Uh, but AI, the, the, the insurance part of AIG is not affected. It's isolated from the contracts that AIG has with all these different other insurance companies, uh, banks. Uh, but uh, So that's the, the component they're looking at. Mm -hmm. But is that tied to the subprime uh, mortgage crisis, or is it a completely different? No, no it, it is tied to it, because clearly um, uh, hedge funds have invested in, in this subprime, um, and uh, they have contracts that are tied to this subprime. So, uh, but, but now it's not, it, it started with a subprime. Right. But then it affected all other type of assets. Mm -hmm. uh, you... And, and, and uh, we talk about the subprime actually, and uh, it's not, it, it went to the, it affected prime mortgages also. Um, and the problem is that it is the assets that the assets were the were the, the cause, not the technique of securitization. It's not pulling together these mortgages and then issue securities backed by those mortgages. Securitization will always stay, will continue to exist. Mm -hmm. It's the type of assets that are put in those pools. Um, so uh, even now, securitization is has been put on a hold, um, and it was a great a great financing tool. Uh, because it has been put on a hold, the market is dry. There is no liquidity, uh, and that would, that is what caused the credit crunch. Mm -hmm. um, I mean, I just I was I, I brought some data because it's it's just amazing when you look at mortgages in two thousand and four two thousand and five. Um, in two thousand and four, it was a, a mi 1,000, no, 1.4 trillion dollars of mortgages that were originated. In the second quarter of 08, it was 242 billion dollars of mortgages that were originated. And it, it's just, uh, and why? Well, you cannot securitize them anymore. Yeah, yeah. So uh, if you cannot securitize, that means you cannot finance these loans. There's no, the people that are still willing to buy a property, have a hard time obtaining a mortgage. Mm -hmm. um, but you know, my my sense was that this uh, secure this idea of securitizing mortgages was a fairly new thing. Is it not? Have they always securitized? No, mortgages? it started uh, with Fannie, Fannie Mae, Freddie Mac in the seventies, um, really eighty or late seventies, um, and that was actually a way of of lowering the cost. Uh, lowering interest on mortgagors because you would have access to investors because ultimately they're the one lending money to mortgagors. Mm -hmm. uh, if you look at the process, a bank lends to an individual, but the bank is going to sell the mortgage right away to Fannie Mae, Freddie Mac, then investment bank got involved, and they will in turn sell the securities in the market to investors. So. The investors are the one actually financing these mortgages, um, and uh, now nobody wants to invest in these securities. Right. right. So, um, it, well, the the only one that people are interested in investing would be in Fannie Mae and Freddie Mac mm -hmm. because they're insured, 
Um, so that's uh, and FHA loans. Uh, they also insured. So th there is no credit risk. Right. But any anything else, investor won't touch. Now you hear all these hundreds of millions of dollars uh, that are involved in this uh, uh, federal bailout. I mean, in one while it was seven hundred million. It, it, mm -hmm. it must be more than that by now. Mm -hmm. Where does this money come from? Especially in such, you know tough economic times. Where does the where does the government get that money? Well, from? they issue bonds. Uh, they uh, they create money by uh, buying uh, securities from banks. Uh, but the problem is that uh, in doing in doing so, when they buy securities from banks, banks are not using that money to make loans. Mm -hmm. They're using it to to cover the losses. And that's why the economy has stopped completely. And that is the problem. We were in a situation where we're not moving forward. Yeah. Uh, so all this money has to actually be put to production, not to pay losses. And, and that's what is happening. You know, I was reading uh, an, an online story just the other day about how um, the CEOs of some of these companies, I think of AIG in particular, even though they've gotten all this bailout money and there seems to be a new pot of bailout money for them, you know, every week, but they're still, they seem to be continuing to get bonuses and high salaries, even though stockholders have lost everything. How can this be allowed to happen? Yeah. I used to admire people working in mortgage-backed securities. Uh -huh, right. Um, I knew quite a few people in banks that don't exist anymore. Um, they created wealth for many years, and uh, uh, well, the, the, well the, the salaries were not high. It's the, it's the bonuses that were actually linked directly to the performance. Mm -hmm. I think as long as it's linked to the performance. There's nothing wrong with that, um, but then you could say, well, can a doctor have a, his salary linked to a, the surgery, to the success of a surgery? Right, right. So obviously there is some ethical issues here, um, but now that they're losing money, they should not have bonuses. That's clear because why stockholders should lose money, and uh, other people managing companies and losing money. For the stockholders should get bonuses. Has, and has anybody who is who is running this bailout said said you're not going to get your bonuses? You're not going to get all of this money? Well, they're talking about yeah. it, so yeah. it hasn't been yet decided. But mm -hmm. it, it has been part of the uh, discussion in right. this bailout that uh, uh, some of the bonuses clearly uh, should not be paid and should be used. I mean, again, these bonuses altogether are not going to help us resolve. Uh, the crisis. But they also shouldn't be rewarded with <laughs> but them, they clearly, should be, clearly. Yes, yes. You know, it seems that, you know, from whether you're looking at spurious accounting practices such as you had with Enron, or whether you're looking at the creation of these ex strange and exotic securities that sort of backed up the subprime mortgage business, or it seems that clever people have all, and greedy people, have always found ways to make a lot of money before the house collapses on everybody else. That seems to be a re, uh, a theme that has been repeated in the in recent years in particular. And we've only got a minute left, but I hope you can answer that as best <laughs> well, you can. Well, a clever, for example, uh, in, in, in securitization, uh, yes, the um, um, investment bankers were able to create these exotic uh, structures by slicing and dicing, and investors did not understand exactly what they were buying, but they were told, look, it's good, trust me. Um, but it, eventually the banks lost. Eventually they were hit with their own product. So um, I think for many years, yes, uh, they were smart, but uh, uh, it, it eventually these this, this convoluted structures um, well, actually, again, I, I should not blame the structure. I still go back to the asset mm -hmm. that were put in these securities. Uh, I think the structure is actually somewhere interesting, and it would address different needs for different group of investors. 
it is. I'm going back to these uh, credit cards, which will happen also, mm -hmm. um, subprime mortgages, these teaser loans. They, they were they were uh, rate, they, they would give these these um, variable rate mortgages with rates that were below fixed rate mortgages. Yeah, yeah. And then eventually the payment almost some of them the payment doubled. Right. But it, it looks like an, an economy that that to a certain extent is sort of based on these kind of pyramid scheme types. Yeah, sure. Yeah, sure. And, yes. it, and at some point they just they just collapsed. Well, it's, it's, a, it's a fascinating subject and very complicated, and <laughs> I think we're all um, trying to, to understand learn, it, yes. really, really. Um, unfortunately, we're out of time, but I want to thank Dr. Ann Sisu of CUNY's New York City College of Technology for joining us for the City University of New York and One to One. I'm Cheryl McCarthy.